Is there a book inside of you? This week, we talked to Jerry Jenkins about his life as a writer and the best ways he says you can finish that book you've been meaning to write. It's all in episode 27 of the Church Leaders Podcast. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host, podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, Andrew Hess. Thanks for tuning in to episode 27 of the Church Leaders Podcast. This week, our guest is writer Jerry Jenkins. With 186 books in print, over 70 million copies sold, and 21 New York Times bestsellers, you'll want to hear how Jerry meets his writing deadlines and the best way he says busy leaders can find time for writing. And now, here's our conversation with Jerry Jenkins. Well, Jerry Jenkins, it is such a treat to have you uh, here with us on the Church Leaders Podcast. Jerry, you've had such an amazing career. Uh, 21 New York Times bestsellers, 186 books in print, and over 70 million copies sold. Take us back as we begin to when you got started. Like, when was it that you first knew that you wanted to be a writer? Well, it was when I realized I wasn't going to be a big league baseball player, I think. <laughs> and and uh, that came as a teenager. I was uh, I was a baseball freak like a lot of kids are. You know, little league and then high school ball and everything. But uh, I got hurt playing baseball in high school. And... Uh, it took that to make me realize that even though I'd been raised in the church and, and was a Christian kid and everything, that I had really let sports become, you know, the throne of my life. And uh, I immediately went into sports writing to kind of stay close to the sports scene and to get into the games free. <laughs> and uh, uh, I almost immediately realized that I'd found my niche. And I wasn't a good sports writer yet, but I'd been reading the sports pages all my life. So I kind of had a knack for it. I still had a quarter million cliches to get out of my system and everything, but I was um, 14 when this happened, and I looked older than I was, which was a real advantage then, not so much now, but I went to the local sports um, department of the of the paper, the daily paper, and asked them how they were fixed for sports writers, and they said, why? And I said, because I am one. And they said, well, we'll try you out you know, stringing for the paper and you know covering high school sports games and you know, they didn't know that I wasn't even old enough to drive. I had my parents drive me to the games and drive me to the sports uh, department and everything. And so they were paying me like a dollar an inch for whatever survived their editing and made it to the paper. And uh, I never looked back. I mean, I so I've been I've been a professional writer now for over fifty years. Wow. That's amazing. And a lot of people will know you from the Left Behind series. You know, you, 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 they hear your name like, oh, Left Behind. But mm. a lot of people don't know that I think that was your 125th book. Like that yeah. you had done a lot of writing before that. That's right. I, and, you know, because that was a mega bestseller, I have had a lot of people say, hey, did you ever write anything else? You know, and as you say, that was that was number 125. Now, I've had some some bestsellers before that, never quite of that magnitude, but I had written I'd assisted Billy Graham with his memoir before that. I'd done Oral Hershiser's biography when he had that fantastic year with the Dodgers back in uh, 1988. Had worked with Nolan Ryan and Hank Aaron and you know a lot of sports biographies and um, a lot of Christian fiction before that. So uh, I really had had a successful career, but obviously wasn't known um, the way Left Behind made me known. So I, I consider myself... Um, mono gifted i'm i don't sing or dance or preach this is all i do and that's people often ask you know why so many books because uh, i feel obligated i i have this gift and so i just feel like that's what i should exercise and do you feel like that gift is partly um your ability to produce so many books i mean it seems like you'd have to have some type of efficiency that that most writers wouldn't to to even write that many in a lifetime yeah part of it is speed because of the newspaper background you learn to work quickly and and get on with it and part of it is probably some some form of ADD or something. People often ask, you know, what's your favorite type? Because I've written for kids and adults, and I've written fiction and nonfiction and marriage and family and things like that. And my favorite is always whatever I'm not doing at the time. If I'm if I'm writing a, a biblical fiction uh, piece, then my favorite is a sports biography. If I'm writing a sports biography, then my favorite is some kind of fiction or whatever. It's, it's whatever's next. And so I'm I, I like to be challenge i like the variety and, and it's just fun to always have something to do now and as you look back to the left behind series are there any things that like you know this many years later that you would tweak or change any any you know anything that comes to mind well yeah that's sort of the ironic thing is that i, I teach writers now and the one thing i teach is to not be heavy-handed in, in foreshadowing 
uh, make it obvious where you're going. And I have one big clunky bit of foreshadowing in the very first chapter of the first book in that series where the main character is, you know, I'm setting up the, the scenario and he's daydreaming about this new potential affair he's going to have. And he's upset with his wife because all she can talk about is the rapture and, and her new, you know, faith and everything. Well, obviously what's going to happen is the rapture. And, and yet that one book is the single most uh, successful book I've ever had. It's, you know, pushing 9 million copies right now and in the series over 60 million. And uh, so it's hard to, to argue and say, go back and say you change that, that one clunky piece. But, um, but that is one that I probably would change. It was just a little bit too obvious, but, um, but it worked. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, as you kind of look at uh, pastoral ministry today and, and uh, our audience is mostly pastors, there's a lot of talk about how we tell the story of the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, how we communicate uh, in our sermons and how we do our ministry. Um, how do you think pastors can improve um, the way they communicate as storytellers? You know, I think it's a crucial thing. I think people do um, respond to story and uh, and really, when you look at the Bible, that's what communicated to people even back then. Jesus told stories. In fact, uh, people often say, well, I don't read fiction. I only read the truth. Well, Jesus told stories, and those were clearly fictitious stories. The parables were clearly fictitious, and yet they told truth with a capital T. You know, anytime somebody says there once was a man, people stop and listen. Mm -hmm. What happened to him? What did he do? What was the problem? What was the quest? What was the challenge? So I, I always say, if you if you need an example or need a model, you can't do better than Jesus. I mean, you know, that, that trumps everything. So if, if storytelling was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And when people look at successful churches, and I realize that just having a big church or a lot of numbers is not necessarily the, you know, doesn't mean it's the best. But something's working. People are drawn to it. Sometimes it's just personality. And when that happens, it eventually crumbles and doesn't work. But when... A church has been there a long time and is ministering and reaching, you know, a lot of people and and uh, and all kinds of people, reaching the poor and reaching the lost and reaching the needy, and also ministering to the up and outer as well as the down and outer. Um, it's more than just a personality. What's happening? Uh, it's because the pastor and the leadership has learned how to communicate, and that means they're telling the story in an engaging way, mm. and 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 so rather than communicating with you know, 3.1 billion people are suffering from this or that. They pick out the one person and they tell that story. Yeah. I think of great writers, great newspaper writers, columnists. Uh, some will go to a, a country like Haiti when they had the earthquakes uh, and they'll they'll tell all the statistics and cover it and they, they're going for that Pulitzer Prize where they, you know, have, have got all the statistics. And then you get a guy like Rick Bragg from the New York Times will go in there and, and interview a person who's sitting alone and he just gets the story. He's lost his family. He's lost his home. He's lost everything. And you get to know that person, and it tells you the whole story of that country and what happened without statistics and boring, you know, boring me with all the detail. That's story. And that's why I think uh, people who share their faith, they, you know, you can argue theology and doctrine till you're blue in the face. And that stuff's interesting. It's fascinating to me. I'm not seminary trained, but I love that. I love to listen to people do that. But what reached me was when somebody said, here's what happened to me. This is my story. Here's who I was. Here's how lost I was. Here's how far I was from being happy, from being forgiven, from being redeemed, from being hopeful. I was hopeless. And here's what happened to me. That's a story. And that reaches people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, writers who succeed reach the heart and they reach the soul. I mean, that's story. So if a pastor wants to know what's the difference, why does this guy's church work? And we're not just talking about comparing because I want to be somebody, but I want to be effective. Learn to tell the story. Mm. And what are, like, if, you know, if you were, if there's a pastor who's listening, and it's like, man, what's the one thing I could do to, to improve my storytelling? I mean, is there something that, especially I think, you know, when you're, it's different to tell a story than to, you know, to write one. But what's, what are some of those things that a pastor can do to just, just instantly improve their storytelling? You know, it's not too much different to speak mm. it than to, than to write it. But um, usually it's the idea, if you can, can imagine narrowing it, every time you narrow it, you make it more personal. Tell me a story that moves me, that reaches me. So if you're thinking about, you know, maybe, maybe a pastor has come back from a trip where he was moved. 
and you, you know, the big thing you wonder is where do I start? I remember when I was editor of Moody Magazine years ago, one of our staff writers came back from a big convention and he was having trouble writing the story because it was so big. He'd been there four days. He heard all these speakers. He'd been moved. And he thought, wow, where do I start with the keynotes or all the meetings I went to or all the people I met? Or, and he just he was really locked up. And so he had this big pile of notes and, and uh, outlines and things like that. And he told me, he said, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to go with this. I can, I'm having trouble outlining it. And I said, all right, set all that stuff aside. Now you came. You were pretty excited. Why was that? You know, forget all that stuff. What was it? And he just told it to me as a friend. And what he did was he narrowed it. And every time you narrow it, it gets better. And eventually, he told me his story. And he said, you know, when I went there, I was tired and I was and I wasn't really happy about having to leave my family and go. But what really reached me was the second night, and it wasn't one of the big name speakers. It was it was a story of person and he told me their story what they had really did. I said there's your story let's tell that story hmm. and so that's my first bit of counsel is to narrow it and make it personal and and get it down to people people want to know about people also anytime there's conflict in a story that moves it when, when I talk to fiction writers especially they talk about they're writing along in their their novel and all of a sudden they lose interest and I always say if the writer loses interest the reader will lose interest 10 times as much if you're moved, your reader will cry. If you're bored, your reader's asleep, you know, so multiply it. Well, if you lose interest in your story, almost 100% it's because the, there's no conflict. You've got characters speaking to each other, and everything is nice. They're having a nice meal. That's a nice day. They're happy to be together. That's nice in real life. I, I don't like conflict in real life. I'm happy to go out with my wife and have a nice meal and say that it's a nice night. And if I wrote to you about that, you'd go, oh, that's great, but I have things to do. Mm. But if I told you that we all of a sudden had an argument, I said something nice and she responded with a cold stare or snapped back, you go, why? What happened? What was the, you know, that's more interesting. Conflict is interesting. That's what keeps us turning the pages. So narrow the story, make it personal, reach the heart and, and find out where the conflict is. A lot of the people that are in our audience um, are really busy people. And I think a lot of them probably have at some point in their life thought, I mean, there's a story inside of me or there's a book inside of me that I would love to write but they've just kind of set it on the shelf. Like I'll just never have time to do that. Like maybe I'll do that when I'm retired. How do busy leaders make time to, you know, to write the book they've been wanting to, you know, they're right that they, that they don't have time. And it also honors writers when they say that. So often I have people tell me I'd write a book too, if I just had the time as if that's all they need is time. I've had people say, I had a, a counselor one time tell me he would write a book if he had time. I said, that's interesting because I'd like to counsel if I had the time. And he said, oh, you're, I didn't know you were trained for that. So apparently I need to be trained for his work, but he doesn't need to be trained for mine. And it'd be the same if I said, I'd, I'd love to preach a great sermon if I just had the time, if I just had time to write a sermon. That's an insult to a pastor. You need to be called and trained. And you know there there are things that need to be learned before you can do that. But there are a lot of writers out there who could help you write a book. And the one caveat I would, would add is that there are pastors who've learned that they have a lot of great material. They don't have time to write books because, for one thing, we've turned successful pastors into CEOs and administrators. And it may be doing them a disservice, but that's real life, and that's not going to change, likely. So they probably don't have time to write books. They can't get away for four months or so and hole up in a cabin somewhere and, and really give it the time it deserves. But it is their material, and they they need to have full veto power over every word and to make sure it's what they want. That only takes a week or so once somebody else has really done the organizing and, and writing it. So find a writer and give them your outline and all your material and let them do it. But the caveat that I, I add is let them share that byline. Let it be an as told to or a with or an and. Nobody's going to think you didn't do the work or that isn't your material. Or and, and most people ignore that anyway. But too many people are putting their name on a book that somebody else has done the work. And then that writer doesn't get any credit. They might may have even been paid handsomely, but they need it for their resume, for their work, for their livelihood in the future. And it's a little bit of deception. I don't think anybody means to. It's a ghost writing. And, and some people are happy to do it. Some writers are happy to do it. They say, I just do it for the money. I don't need my name on it. I encourage writers to put your name on it. It's fair. It's ethical. It's the right thing to do. So 
you got a freebie there. One was get somebody to help you write the book if you if you want to, and give them some credit. It doesn't have to be the same size type, but just get it on the cover, as told to John Smith, whoever it is. It helps them, doesn't hurt you, and your material material is out there. It seems like that uh, in your career, you've kind of, um, in the last several years, shifted into focusing on mentoring up-and-coming writers, young writers. And why did you have a desire to start working with developing writers? You know, it, I've really done that longer than people know. It's only become more known because I've become more known. I've done that for many years. I've often always taught at writers' conferences. But when I was a teenager, I had a, a favorite writer. His name was Jim Hefley. And he taught writing, and he also wrote, um, I don't know if he wrote much fiction, but he wrote a lot of the as-told-to autobiographies of athletes, too. So I read those, and I noticed that his name was on a lot of them. Then I found out he lived in the Chicago suburbs, not far from where I lived. And so uh, my Youth for Christ director knew him, and so I wangled an uh, introduction. And I was so impressed as a 15- or 16-year-old that he didn't just brush me off with an autograph and good luck to you. When he found out I wanted to be a writer, he let me visit his office and look at his bookshelf and tell me why he had all these books and and told me how he worked, spent time and and gave me some advice and told me I could call him anytime or write to him and he'd answer. It really impressed me. And I remember thinking, if I ever make it in this business, I want to be like that as far as helping people and, you know, passing it forward. I had no idea that I would ever be really successful. I actually determined that I would answer every letter I I got. That has become very difficult. When you have a series that sells in the tens of millions, you get hundreds of thousands of letters. And I didn't know anything about email back then. Nobody did. But, you know, I've maintained that. Now, I I have some boilerplate paragraphs that I'll paste in and stuff. But I do personal introductions and and finishes so that people know that I'm, I'm really talking to them. And I'll mention something about their note. They tell me about their dog or their husband or their, you know, some, their kid in the military or whatever. I don't know how many I've answered, but it's all of them. And then helping writers, I just said, share the wealth. You know, why not pass it along and help people? I've had people say, why would you share your secrets? Why would you teach writers when, you know, you're in essence uh, inventing competition for yourself? This isn't competition. There's plenty of pie for everybody. It's not like if I give somebody some, there's less for me. I haven't found that true. The more you give, the more you get. And uh, it's been so gratifying. So for years I owned the Christian Writers Guild, and now it's just called the Jerry Jenkins Writers Guild, and I do it all online at jerryjenkins.com. And I have webinars and blogging you know, frequently and uh, conferences and all kinds of things that people can get, most of it free. So people want to learn or just pick up tips for writing, that's all there. Yeah. And as you work with those young up-and-coming writers, what are some of the common mistakes that uh, first-time writers seem to make? Well, the biggest one is that people think they want to start their career with a book, and that becomes easier to do nowadays because you can, you know, there are places that will publish anything you want almost for free, and plenty of them that will do it for money. If you send them a check, they'll, you know, it's not really publishing, it's being printed. And they'll do it without editing or proofreading, and it looks like it. And there are other places that will do all that stuff for you for a certain amount of money too. But you need to learn how to write first. And so I always tell people, don't start with a book, finish with a book. A book is where you arrive, not where you start. Before I published my first book, I had written for newspapers and magazines and and started small, and I wrote for free markets where you write for your church newsletter and for, you know, local papers and things which are almost free, and then you grow to denominational magazines and Sunday school papers and learn the craft and hone your skills and polish your your work. And nowadays you, you could be blogging and writing online and that type of thing, but learn the craft, and people don't want to do that. And most of them don't want to learn. They skip the stage of learning and growing because why not just write my book and somebody will, I can put it online. I can, you know, have it self-published. The problem is it looks like it. And as so many people are doing that, there's more competition than ever. The cream still rises. So I say, find those places like my, and and certainly my website is not the only one. There's plenty of places that will teach you how to write, Uh, learn how to do it. And then you'll stand out from the crowd and, you can compete in that marketplace. Mm-hmm. As you, like, I mean, as, as writers set out, is there kind of like one piece of advice that you're like, this is where to start, or this is the thing you must always do? Well, for instance, with fiction writers, people don't, don't know some of the cardinal rules, like um, the current 
way to write fiction is with a perspective character, a point of view character, at the very least one point of view character per scene. Now, I write most of my novels with one point of view character per book. Now, with a big one like Left Behind, uh, I, I had two point of view characters, and when I switched between them, I made it very clear who was who. And then in some of the later books, when they got bigger and, and broader, they were covering the globe, I might have five different perspective characters, but it was very clear to the reader which perspective character's voice I was in and, and where we were. I get not, not <clears throat> manuscripts now where I see the point of view character switching within the same sentence. You know, one character will be talking to the other, and you'll, you'll be in both of their heads. What, you know what both of them are thinking. And they'll point back to some classic they read from 100 years ago saying, well, that's how that writer did it. Well, that was popular 100 years ago, to have an omniscient viewpoint where the author knew what everybody was thinking and everybody was doing all at the same time. It simply isn't the way it works now. You have to know those basics, and you can learn that fairly quickly if you come to a site like mine or go to a writer's conference or you know, get, to, get into a writer's club or a you know, critique group. That's the danger if you don't do that. If you go rogue and decide, I know better, and just go by yourself and write a manuscript, you find out all of a sudden it doesn't sell. Then you have to self-publish, and that either costs or you put out a manuscript that's no good, and then you wonder why you're not successful and are not an overnight success. Mm -hmm. Do you have some favorite fiction that you like to read? Or I know some writers kind of don't like to read other or as much other work just to keep their own creativity. Are there, are there authors that you love to, to read? I read really widely. And uh, sometimes I'm a little hesitant to say who because some people think you shouldn't be reading these people because they're, you know, they're not all Christian writers. And, but I think you need to be discerning. I mean, there are, things, there are people that I wouldn't imitate because of some of the things they write. But, you know, one person that I think is a, a great writer and, and is sometimes uh, underestimated because of what he writes is Stephen King. There's a reason that he, that he has about, you know, more than 40 novels and they're all still selling after 40 years of writing. It's not just because of the genre or because he's a horror writer. He's a good writer. And there are things we can learn from him about being writing evocative settings and writing crisp dialogue. And, you know, there are things he does that I wouldn't do. Um, but I've met him, and we've talked, and we respect each other. And, and you know, I, I've learned an awful lot from what he does. Uh, Dean Koontz is another one. And um, I think the best living nonfiction writer we have, in fact, I think the best living writer is, is uh, Rick Bragg, I, whom I mentioned, the former New York Times columnist, he wrote a memoir about growing up in the Deep South, uh, uh, one of three children of a single mom, called All Over But the Shoutin', which is like poetry. It's prose, but it's just, I don't even try to, to emulate him. I just surrender. I mean, I, I will not live long enough to write like Rick Bragg, but I recommend him to every person who wants to be a writer. It's just uh, beautiful stuff. So let's talk about um, your writing routine. Um, are there, I mean, I'm sure there's been changes throughout your career, but is there kind of routines, like ways that, that you write that our audience could learn from? Yeah. A lot of people think that because I write so much that I must write every day and I don't, I'm very much a compartmentalizer. So I like to have my breaks and when I'm on deadline, I go off and I, I only write. So I, I'll, what I do is I, the work that I do before noon is the best writing I'll do all day. So I get up, you know, crack of dawn and I write. But the first thing I do every day is I do a heavy edit and rewrite of what I wrote the day before. And that catapults me into the writing for that day. Starting is the hardest thing for me. But when I'm doing my creating, when I'm starting, and I'm basically talking about fiction now, if I'm creating from nothing, I turn off my internal editor. Because if I try to make it perfect and try to, you know, make my grammar correct and spelling and avoid redundancies and cliches, it'll slow me down and tie me up. And I need to get that body of work down. I need to get the story down. So I forget all that stuff and just tell the story. And I'm literally not thinking about how bad it might be. And, and I wouldn't show it to my worst enemy. <laughs> and if it seems to come easy, the next day I find out why, because it needs an awful lot of work. If I struggle through it, the next day I might, the editing might be easier because it's, you know, I, I've worked hard on it. But that next day, so every day I'm, I'm backing up 10 pages or 20 pages, whatever I wrote the day before, and I put on my editor's hat and I fix all the cliches and redundancies and 
all the mistakes and until I'm happy with it. And then I flip the switch and turn off that editor and and write my pages for that day. And then when I'm done with the whole manuscript, I start back from the beginning and I really comb through it until I'm happy with every word and then I'm done. So however many, you know, really that's that's twice through because I've written it and edited it every day and then I can go through it again. Now if I need to go through it again because it just doesn't feel right or, or certain sections, I make sure I don't transmit anything to the publisher that I'm not entirely happy with. And then I still count on them to have their editorial <laughs> staff and proofreaders go through it. So that's my routine. Mm. You know, you've written so many books that have meant so much to people that have been even more than a great story, but have like touched lives and 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 had a message that, you know, is spiritual, that that calls people to richer life, richer living. How do you do that? How do you how do you tell a good story but then also have a message, you know, in that story that that you're kind of, you know, how how can writers do that well? You know, that that's a matter of surrendering. I think you can only write out of the overflow. And um, that's an interesting dynamic because I travel so much. We, we travel about 50% of the time, and that's a handicap for a writer because you need to be, you need to have a private life and a devotional life. And I remember going to the pastor of the church we, go, we attend right now, and I told him we were thinking about coming to the church. And, you know, you don't want to be a celebrity in your church, and you don't, you know, it's nice to be known and recognized and everything and appreciated, but I said, you know, what happens when I come to a church is that people tend to first get excited about that, and and I said, that's fine, but I don't want to be enlisted right away to be a Sunday school teacher or on the board or even in the choir and all that stuff that, you know, someday I'd love to do. I really would, and, and in days past when I had a family and settled into a church, I did, and wasn't traveling as much. But I need a place where I can just come and do nothing but sit and drink in. Because otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm only coming once or twice a month as a rule. That's a big month for me. <laughs> otherwise, I'm out speaking or interviewing or working, and I can be depleted. When I come here, I'm, I'm coming as an empty slate, you know. And so basically what I was saying was, I'd love to come, but can I come and, and not be considered a reprobate if I don't do anything? And he said, yes. I'll, I'll let that happen. You know. So I need to do that. And then I can write books where I've got something in the tank that can come out. Otherwise, you feel like you sit at the keyboard the same way, just emptied. You've given everything wherever you went to speak or you know, minister. There, there's nothing worse than a writer who's supposed to be ministering. That's what we're really called to do, who's working on an empty tank. Because then you, you, you start faking it. You know the right words to say and to write. But if you're not feeling it, it shows. And I think the reader can tell, too. So tell us about, um, you know, you've been doing a lot of work with your website, encouraging writers, helping writers. How can people um, be a part of that and, and learn from you? Yeah, if they just visit jerryjenkins.com, there's an awful lot of free stuff there, the blogs and, and webinars and that type of thing. And uh, we're, we're moving toward a setup where they can actually subscribe, you know, and, be, and become you know, regular sort of members of the guild. And even if they don't want to, it's going to be very reasonable, you know, reasonable monthly cost and that type of thing. But they, you know, nobody's obligated to do that. I'll still have free stuff there all the time. So um, just check in. I've got free downloads and, and things they can plug into always available. Great. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast and such, it's just a fascinating life and uh, so many great books. I mean, the list goes on and on. And are you still kind of thinking about, about your next book even now? I am. I'm getting ready to go in the cave and, and finish my next one that uh, will be out early in 2016. Great. Do you, do you have a title you can tell us? Or? It's The Valley of the Dry Bones. So it's a contemporary based on the prophecies, obviously, of Ezekiel. Oh, wow. Well, we'll look forward to, to catching that. So thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, thanks again to Jerry Jenkins for joining us this week as our guest on the Church Leaders Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review us in iTunes, and consider sending this episode to someone you know who may be blessed by its message. Make sure also to download the show notes for this episode at churchleaders.com forward slash podcast. And in the show notes, you'll find resources mentioned in the show and linked to some of Jerry's top content on churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. 
for articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day. Visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.